right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Brent Keltner, who is in Boston, Massachusetts, where the Boston Marathon is taking place today. How are you doing? Or had did take place? Well, who knows? Probably people still finishing, right, Brent? Uh, there are people still finishing. I'm doing well, John, and I wish I was in San Diego. We were out there just a couple of months back. Beautiful oh, yeah. weather, day after yeah, day yeah. after day. <laughs> It is, it is. Well, we did have some rain last week. I mean, it does happen, you know. So, um, uh, and Brent uh, created the um, Winalytics value-driven growth method methodology and has uh, and has positioned the company as market leader for repeatable revenue solutions. Did I pronounce that correctly? Is it yeah, Win? Yeah. Win, yeah, Winalytics. Winalytics, yep. Winalytics, perfectly. All right. And so what we're going to talk about today is landing and expanding key accounts faster. Okay, so so um, let's get straight into it. Um, why is it, Brent, do you think that when it comes to key accounts, right, number one, often times in companies, there maybe isn't even a good definition of what a key account is, or even a strategy around key accounts. So just talk about key accounts themselves for a moment like what is what are the characteristics of key accounts and why is it important to have these very well defined yeah I, we think of key accounts as you know there are five or six places that could purchase from you or maybe more right it's not a single two level sale you got some users and somebody who's writing a check but there are mul multiple pockets of budget around the enterprise or around the university or around the government organization and uh, your job often is to figure out how to connect value across those so you can tap into different budgets. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. And I think that's what, but here's the thing, right, is sometimes when somebody lands a new account, say a new piece of business, uh, there's sometimes there's a reluctance to start fishing around within that account you'll find that sometimes sales people are like you know i don't want to i don't want to rock the boat here so they don't look on it as an expansion or a growth opportunity they look at it as i, I hold what i have yeah 100 percent. and one of the things um you know we advocate uh written a book about it is always start with value playbooks right is what what value playbook is how does your product or service drive value for your buyer it's not about the product itself and so when before mm -hmm. you build a value playbook usually what we're thinking of is oh okay to go sell another product i got to make another budget ask but if you start thinking about value playbooks it's then how do i add incremental value on my last purchase so let's take a great example augmetics uh, which basically digitizes note-taking in medical offices. Uh, they have an amazing uh, land and expand strategy under this uh, John Hawkins told us a story about they go first to um, general medicine, right? Because they know there's going to be a need. Everybody's scrambling around. Nobody can know there's going to be a need. Not a great ROI case. General medicine has a hard time paying for it. So then they go to a specialty area right? Orthopedics or something high margin. Now they've got a budget and they get 20 physicians across those two. Then they go to the CFO. They say, do you know how much physician time we're saving you? Wouldn't you like to take this enterprise wide? So you've gone from meet guys that are scrambling to meet higher touch service to there's an efficiency argument. And each one is a slightly different value play that they can support. So when you start thinking about seeding value plays, now you're not so much, hey, I don't want to push. I don't want to push. It's, hey, can I present a new opportunity to deepen our relationship around a new area of value? No, absolutely. And I think the, the other part of that to underline that's really important there is there's a strategy built into this, right? It's not a haphazard thing. It's a, it's a strategic approach. So uh, when it comes to key account planning, Again, that's that's something that I don't think there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of people who don't do it very well. There's some people who do it very well. And there's a lot of people who don't do it very well because they don't know how to do it very well. Mm. Yeah, 100 percent. I think it's also because, I mean, you know, like Kia Account Planning, it's 60 years old. I can't remember the English uh, advertising agency that invented it. And 
if you look at most account plans, it feels industrial, right? It feels like, sure. all right, I do a market scan and then I do a competitive analysis and I do my relationships and we're always like, okay, what value are you providing to different buyers? Start there. Mm. And then what value have you unlocked another? So what we say is think about your handoff from closing to expansion as a continuous process. What were all the use cases you documented as part of the close? What are the ex expansion use cases? And then just start going through one after another, where are the areas for expanding value? So another story in our book, Parsable, they are a handheld uh, manufacturing automation workflow, right? For Coca-Cola bottlers or for, you know, for um, bottlers or cement manufacturers or um, pulp and paper manufacturers, they can sell the 14 different personas, right? right? They can sell to a production manager or quality manager, continuous improvement, environmental manager, safety manager. Um, if you build out a big plan, you can go really deep on every one of those. You can go deep on their market situation, their five-year plan, all their competitors, and that's all valuable. What's a, more valuable is how do I make that quality manager happy? How do I make that CI manager happy? What's in it for them? How do I make the production manager and how can that roll up to the VP? And so now if you think about your major account planning, how do I deliver value to each persona or business unit? Uh, and which areas of value have I untapped and which haven't I? You can start to put together account planning less in this stuff that feels academic and more in the what's the next buyer I can make happy and how can I socialize the, the buyers I've already made happy, right? So Parcelable, their land and expand strategy, it's either I'm, I'm working with Semex in Mexico, a plant. I can go regional to the U.S. plants based on how much I improved continuous improvement, their production and quality process, or I have an environmental initiative with, uh, and I've done a great job there in capturing environmental incidences and reducing those. Now I can go over to the production manager or the quality manager or the safety manager saying, hey, our handheld works really well. So I think you can do account planning better, need all the background stuff, but think about how do I unlock buyer value for each of my buyers? How many have I targeted? What are my new areas of buyer value? Honestly, it's a lot more exciting when we work with teams. They're like, holy heck, now I can become a hero to all those people yeah. that get on yeah. the customer success call. We're like, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I, I love what you just said. And that's part of the reason why we built into Pipeliner CRM, we built in the org chart, the buying center, the relationship mapping capabilities. So you can visually lay out exactly what you talked about, lay out the, how the organization is, is structured, subsidiaries, you know, uh, partners, distributed, all of that, the people, and then on each uh, opportunity itself, you know, you lay out who are the people influencing that. But yeah, and what, what are the different relationships? Because to your point, when you lay it all out visually like that, you st it does become more exciting and less academic and exercise. Yeah, and it sounds like I, ha I have not seen it. So I'm going to have to get a demo it's afterwards. Gonna have, yeah, you will. You have to trust me on it. And I'm going to have a go yourself. Yeah. Well, but it sounds like you've done what HubSpot did for pipelines, right? You can start to move stuff around dynamically for account plans. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then you can build org charts. You can build buying centers with people and contact relationships, even internally, or externally, the whole thing. So because we live, I think the point is, and, and, and it ties into what you were saying earlier, is that we live, to, we live in this more and more networked, obviously, world. And therefore, to understand your, your buyer, to understand your customer, you have to understand their political map, how their universe is laid out. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the other part is, um, is one of the things is when you start to do, obviously, account planning and, and looking to grow accounts is it's it, and I notice as I'm taking this off one of the quotes from from one of your customers. But, you know, it's very easy to look at things from in terms of your own product and how do I expand the products It's a lot harder to look at the white space and say, OK, where can I create opportunity? Yeah, or, yeah, hundred percent. Or in your or in your lexicon value, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent is um, that that is. I mean, often it's like white space means. Oh, what product haven't I sold them? Yeah. 
But if you flip it to what you just said, which is white space is creating value for a new buyer, you know, I think there's a, a lot more energy that can be created there. And the other thing that what honestly that does is a lot of um, a major cap planning is connecting technical value to business value. Mm -hmm. And when you think about um, take Parsable again, for example, okay, I've helping them with maintenance and I'm making them their maintenance more predictive. Well, that actually helps with plant uptime. I have less unplanned outages. Well, maybe I can take that to the production manager. So when you think about value as opposed to just a product line, you actually can make those connections, the interdependencies between the people on the org chart in Pipeliner. Yeah. And it's an interesting, uh, Brent, though, to be able to do this, you need to have a good level of business acumen and you have to have business curiosity. So you have to have curiosity about business and the curiosity about the business of your customer in order to be able to in, in order to be able to spot those opportunities or join those dots. I think once upon a time, you know, there's a lot of people could skate by without, you know, especially in sales, could skate by without, you know excessive business acumen or understanding. I think those days are gone. I think you really, really have to understand the business of your buyers and business in general. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point. I was um, had another conversation like this and they said, why did you write this book? This book we have coming out called The Revenue Acceleration Playbook. And mm -hmm. I said, look, I'm old enough. I was older than this guy. I'm older than you as well to live in the world where the sales guy was could pitch his product, could sell ice to the Eskimo, could close yep. you. That was a good seller. These days, you got to like be empathetic. What's your buyer's pain? Yeah. Can I be a problem solver for you? Can I look for fit around your house? The world has changed to your point. Good problem solving skills, good questioning skills, right? Good just probing on fit. I mean, the world has changed and you have to have a deep understanding and tools as you point out, to understand your buyer and your buyer roadmap and the points of connection, uh, otherwise you're not going to be successful. Product is, just doesn't win in this environment. Yeah, and and obviously then using things like, as you say, the book you have, the Revenue Acceleration Playbook, because uh, whenever you can have people like yourself and your company help you lay out the paths and give you kind of a, a template or a track to run on, I think that's in incredibly important because you can get lost very easily in this stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I yes, and we are big advocates of so you have a template to create playbooks for account planning. We're big advocates of. In the Revenue Acceleration Playbook, we actually, there's more than two dozen plays. And what we say is if you write down a play, any part of the go-to-market organization, then you can start practicing it as a team. Doesn't mean everybody does it the same. Everybody has their own voice. But until you write it down, you can't practice. And if you followed a sports team that didn't have a playbook or practice their playbook, how serious would you think they are? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's, I think that always comes back to a really key point, Brent, and I think we're all guilty of it. And I think we're guilty of it in every job, uh, sales included, is that we don't practice, the, we don't practice half enough. And uh, to be honest, we, I always say we probably spend more time practicing our hobbies than we ever do practicing the thing that puts bread on our table. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And um in a conversation like this, I basically said, so they said, you know, people get busy, they got to run their pipeline. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, commit to what we say is an hour a week, right? one hour as a team-based learning exercise, the next individual coaching with your manager or a third-party coach, it's 3% of your working week to get better at what you do. And the reality is if you committed and you're intentional and what skills or plays are you practicing, three to 5%, you will move the needle. And, and get better. Yeah, and it's always, no, I, I always love that. I mean, and again, we're all guilty of it. We all love to say like, yeah, you know, we're busier than ever. But we don't have time and everything. And I always like to counter that, even with myself, is like, are we though, are we just not more distracted than ever? I guarantee you that hour you're looking for the week, you could probably save that on maybe checking the sports news once a day as opposed to <laughs> twice or three times, you know? That's, if we're being really honest with ourselves. Yeah, com com completely. I wanted to just share one other thought. You might yeah, have thought about one of the biggest opportunities we see in major account planning is to turn your CS organization into a revenue driver. 
not a revenue organization with a quota. That's not their job. Their job is customer care, 100%. But we say all the time that there is no higher form of customer care than sharing with a customer a use case that worked for a peer. Yeah. Just introducing them to them and seeing if that is relevant for them. And I always like to share this story of, because usually when we talk to customer success organizations about introducing new use cases, they say, I'm not a salesperson. I'm not a salesperson. I'm not a salesperson. I tell the story about Jeremy Kelly at Burning Glass. Burning Glass is labor market technology. They capture data on connecting degrees to careers. And there are five places they can serve on a university campus, undergraduate admissions, graduate admissions, career services, the academics, what programs do I build, and then workforce development, short-term certificates. And he would just, great customer success guy, he would start his calls by with showing those five on a slide. Today, we're talking about undergraduate admissions and how you need to recruit around degree ROI. But I, I just want to remind you, these are there are other areas we saw the burning glass. And as we go through and we think about all these, see all these, the platform and the cool data, you know, if anybody else pops into your mind on campus, we might talk to, um, you know, we can come back to it at the end. Yeah. Totally traditional customer success call at the end. He comes back to that slide. So just yeah. reminding you, these are the <laughs> 40, 50 percent of the time. Hey, you should talk to so and so in the business school. So yeah. You should talk to so-and-so in career services. So want to get that message out to customer success teams that introducing new use cases doesn't make you a salesperson. It's the highest form of customer care, introducing other ways to provide value. Yeah, no, I, I agree totally. And, and I, to be honest, and I always, I, I never liked this idea anyway of people like they get scared and go, oh, no, I'm, I'm not a salesperson. Or, yeah. And then you even get, to be honest, I mean, when I was running Hathaway, you know, we worked with uh, big organizations and sometimes like they'd have thousands of salespeople, but you can't call them salespeople. They had a, you know, a made up name for them. And I was always like, yeah, but like your customer knows their salesperson, so it's kind of pointless, but hey, whatever you want to do. <laughs> I think the same thing here is, yeah, nobody, if you're solving a problem, your customer care, if you're solving a problem, you're keeping a customer happy, of course, they're going to be open to listen to other things. So why wouldn't you do that? 100%. I mean, if you built that trusted advisor, you met their first need, you provided yeah. value to the first persona. Now you got credibility, say on both sides, is there another area of value? Yeah. And let's face it. I mean, to your point, though, uh, is is again, like human nature being what it is, if we're having a really good experience as a customer and you're doing everything, um, everything to to help us and, and I'm happy with it, then I'm kind of I kind of start looking around even myself sort of saying, well, I must tell other people about this because, you know, we love to share that kind of stuff. But to your point, though, if I haven't if I haven't been shown these other parts, then maybe I'm just going to share my great experience with somebody irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, what do you think, uh, Brent? What do you think the uh, um, what do you think is a, another key area that people are overlooking when it comes to uh, selling more to and expanding existing customers? Well, I I just I mean. We didn't underline it. I just want to underline it. Sure. If you want to be a great go-to-market team as opposed to a good go-to-market team, practice. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, I mean, dif I, I, I that's what that's differentiates great the great from the good. Uh, you go to the field with the playbook, you practice it. It's not optional for any player. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. And and apparently, uh, you know, the late Kobe Bryant, apparently he used to be the first one in the gym and he was practicing the same drills he practiced when he was in high school. And uh, like people would think, oh, he's probably out there practicing some super duper fancy thing. No, practicing the basics. Yeah. Yeah. Derek Jeter would be another one. Tom yeah. Brady. <laughs> it's just practicing the basic over and over again. I, I think the other thing I would say is. You know, in our world, we talk a lot about personas and what value mm -hmm. plays they care about. But I would encourage all these go-to-market teams, you got to get to those value plays. Is it about driving revenue? Is it about reducing costs? Is it about increasing the reach of your staff or increasing capacity? Is it about changing a user experience? When you start with a persona, you can get deep in with multiple conversations that don't connect. Mm. And That's so we always say, point. start with your value plays and then line up personas by those and then build out your content assets and your success stories around those. Because if you start with the value plays 
as you get deeper in, it's a lot easier. Okay, the first point of connection is around revenue generation or cost efficiency or scaling reach. Great. Second point of connection is, so if you connect personas, very powerful concept. If you connect personas to value plays, you can now start to see the intersection around expansion opportunities. I think that's the other untapped opportunity. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point for people to to take away today. Because yeah, because sometimes if we just focus too much on personas, and then sometimes we create personas that are a little too broad, a little too um, ill-defined, or we try to make a composite of of what we think somebody will, but it's never somebody who would all have all of these pieces. So I think what you're talking about is a, is a much more focused way of doing it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great one, I think, starting with the value and not with the personas themselves. And again, because sometimes people get so carried away in personas, it becomes a project in itself, you know, that goes on forever. Yeah. Um, so listen, this has been fantastic. Listen, all of Brent's information is going to be below the video and links to the book. But before we go, Brent, do tell people a little bit more about you, the book and your company. Yeah, so I would just say anybody who's interested in the book or finding out more what you've heard in the podcast, go to the website, www.authenticitywins.com. Set up the book that talks more about the revenue acceleration playbook. Um, and just two ideas that you can, why it may be valuable for you. There are more than 25 plays in the revenue acceleration playbook across building your value playbooks prospecting, sales, and deal velocity, closing and expansion, customer success. There's a lot of plays you can implement. Every one or two you implement will make you better. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to help you think about where's the lowest hanging fruit for me? What one, two, three plays, which one play per team do I want to implement uh, is one thing. And then I think what you'll also see is we take very seriously this build a play, figure out how to put it into practice. So yeah. you will learn how do you start to practice as a team so you can sharpen uh, your game. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, make that a priority for you now is between now and the end of the year and going into next year, you know, start practicing, practice, 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 you know, get those plays going so you can do them second nature and check out the revenue acceleration playbook. Uh, and listen, thanks again, Brent. This is great stuff. Uh, I think there's great takeaways for everybody. My name is John Golden. I'll see you all again really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah.